Welcome, everyone, to What to Watch Live, the show where we discuss the best in TV and entertainment this week. My name is David, and today I am joined by my fellow Xfinity editors, Gordon, and the Diana Ross to our Supremes, it's Kayla. <laughs> I love it. True. Hello, True. everyone. How's everyone doing? Oh, fantastic. Pretty good. Good. Pretty good. 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 Good, 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 good. Glad to hear it. It's a it's little Friday. It's, Friday, here, but it's Friday. How bad could it be? I That's mean, true. It was it was snowing last week here in the Philadelphia area. It's rainy and gloomy today, but it's warm and sunny in our hearts. And here on Twitter and all of your Xfinity platforms, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, on today's <laughs> show, we celebrate Black History Month with a look at big news in the world of movie musicals. Uh, we explore the best and brightest of Black cinema, take a trip back in time with our favorite film eras and TV sitcoms, and help you plan your TV watch list for the week ahead. So, without further ado, let's kick things off with In the News. Oprah Winfrey has revealed the cast for the upcoming movie adaptation of the Tony Award-winning musical The Color Purple. Speaking to Vanity Fair, Oprah says American Idol alum Fantasia Taylor will play Selly, a character she also played on Broadway in 2017. Euphoria favorite Coleman Domingo will play Mr. Actress Halle Bailey, will play, uh, who will play Ariel in the upcoming adaptation of The Little Mermaid, will appear as Nettie. Taraji P. Henson will play Suge Avery. Corey Hawkins will play Harpo. Orange is the New Black alum Danielle Brooks will reprise her role uh, from Broadway as Sophia. And Grammy Award winning singer Her will make her proper big screen debut as Squeak. Of course, the Color Purple musical itself derived from the 1985 Steven Spielberg movie that earned Oprah an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress. And that movie was based on Alice Walker's 1982 novel chronicling 40 years in the life of a Black woman living in rural Georgia. Uh, Gordon, I know you are specifically a huge musical buff. I'm going to start with you and see what you think about this casting or the, the musical in general. Well, I've, I've seen the movie The Color Purple. I've never seen the musical. Um, this cast look, list looks really good, uh, knowing what I know about the characters. Uh, I just got to say, uh, thank you, Oprah, for taking a shot on a musical. Uh, just because after what happened with West Side Story, which was amazing, and Cats, which was less so, uh, it, it is kind of a, maybe a brave move to step, go forward with a, a, a movie musical. But thank you for, for giving another shot, Oprah. I, super, I personally super appreciate it. Kayla, this is a huge cast. Any thoughts on um, what they've done here in terms of getting the right people in the right roles? Yes, huge cast. Um, I was really excited to see all the names there. I, I remember seeing um, Taraji P. Henson's name a couple days ago, and so I'm glad that now the whole cast is revealed. Um, it looks amazing. I know Hallie is going to do an amazing job. Um, Fant I did watch Fantasia's season of American Idol, so... Um, uh, not to age myself, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> too late. Excited for her. <laughs> yes, I think it's it's going to be great. I love Danielle Brooks. I loved Orange Is the New Black, so I I love her and everything she's in, honestly. Um, but I'm super excited, and I know that if Oprah had has anything to do with this, what she does, I know it's going to do the original film justice because that's always the question, right? Like, uh, is it going to be as good? And you know, I think with Oprah behind it, it's going to be a okay. Plus some. I'm, yes, and your daughter. <laughs> and that's, 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 okay. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really excited to see what her can do on uh, in an acting role. She played herself yeah. in a small part in a movie called Yes Day. Um, and she's, of course, done music videos. But like this is a, a proper role from her. And she's obviously an incredible musician. Um, but I feel like even though she's a Grammy Award winner and uh, very popular, I feel like the, there's a large portion of the world who has not discovered her. And I think this is going to be really huge for, for her. For, for her. For her. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, too. I'm excited to see her in there. Her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, 
if you've never seen Spielberg's The Color Purple and want to check it out, the movie is actually currently available for free to Xfinity customers with HBO Max, Sundance TV, TBS, or AMC+. So great opportunity to catch that during Black History Month. Just say The Color Purple into your voice remote. So let us move on now and really kick things off in a segment called Collections Corner. As we mentioned, February is Black History Month, and the Black Experience team, including our very own Kayla, has put together an incredible collection of movies and more to celebrate this important moment. Kayla, can you tell us more about it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so this past Tuesday, we kicked off our Black History Month campaign, and I couldn't be more excited. Um, the theme this year is very close to my heart. It is independent Black film. Um, and we're celebrating Black filmmakers, directors, producers, writers, creators, <laughs> everywhere. Um, there are plenty of indie films that you can watch for free, um, including but not limited to School Days, Eve's Bayou, Daughters of the Dust, and more. There's a series of networks that will also be making their content available for free throughout the month of February. So this week, you'll see that we have TV One and Clio TV. Those are available to watch for free this week up until February 7th. Um, and stay tuned for the coming weeks because we'll have networks you can watch for free, including Aspire TV, Black and Sexy TV, Revolt, the Africa Channel, and Quelly TV. Um, that will be a series of, you know, free throughout the month. So keep coming back every week to see what you can watch from those networks. Um, for historical context, I created a row of all the different pivotal moments in black film broken out by decade and era. So in the early 1900s, you had the race film era. This was the impetus for black independent filmmaking um, and came as a response to the misrepresentation of black people and black culture um, and by in Hollywood, mainstream Hollywood. Um, in the mid 1950s, the black film movement came to a halt due to ironically integration and more black people being cast into those mainstream films. Um, and that led us into the civil rights era where we saw a rise of documentary filmmakers. In the 70s, we saw the black power and black exploitation era. Um, this was also a time um, of the LA rebellion film movement um, whose chief ambition was to rewrite standard cinematic language in order to represent their own vision of black people and culture. Then enter in the 90s, Spike Lee's feature debut, She's Gotta Have It, which was huge and became the driving force behind what would become the new black wave during the 90s and um, early 2000s. And that brings us into today's world, where cinema is moving into a more digital realm, creating more opportunities for independent black storytelling. Um, I also put together a collection of essential films um, that you have to watch if you don't watch anything else, <laughs> like Moonlight, Get Out, Fruitvale Station, and more. You can browse indie films by genre, so drama, comedy, romance, horror, that one's for you, Scott, uh, documentary, and uh, Nollywood Nigerian films. Um, you can also browse by Black-owned film studio, like Will Packer Productions, Monkey Paw Productions, which Jordan Peele's company, um, Tyler Perry Studios, and more. There's just so much to explore in this collection, and um, I can't wait for everybody to see it. Um, I, I'm really... Uh, proud of it, as you guys can see. And uh, all you have to do is say Black History Month into your X1 voice remote and celebrate the power and significance of independent Black storytelling. There is so much to love here. Um, and we're going to dive a little deeper um, into some of these uh, sections later in the show. So I don't want to spoil anything there. But I am loving that free indie films row um, because some of the, as we know, Kayla, like some of the best stories being told by Black filmmakers are being told in the independent film realm right now. I mean, that's right. really, really amazing stories. And one of them that you have included is Tangerine, which is one of my favorite movies of the last several years. Um, it was all, it's a, it's a miracle of filmmaking. It's all shot on an iPhone, the, the whole thing. And it's about a transgender sex worker who discovers that her, I think her pimp boyfriend cheated on her and she's like hunting him down all over Hollywood. 
And it's mm-hmm. it's funny and, and clever and beautifully shot. And they spend a lot of time in this donut shop that I actually tracked down last time I was out in LA because I had to see the donut shop where, where Tangerine was shot. <laughs> I was just like so obsessed with this movie. So h- highly recommend it. Yes. Um, how, were the, how were the donuts? <laughs> oh, I just wanted to, I just looked at it. I didn't go in. Oh, the oh, you didn't say- I, sh- oh. I should have. <laughs> I just wanted to look at the outside. Down of- a donut shop doesn't get a donut. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't even occur to me. For, for some reason, all I think about is food. I don't know why I didn't think to eat the donuts. I was like, I'm just going to take a photo of it. Um, I also, Kayla, I also thought it was really cool, the rows that you have that break out content um, from Black-owned film studios and Black-owned networks uh, that are mm-hmm. on our platforms. And like, I don't mean to like put you on the spot because I didn't ask you about this, but like, could you tell us more about those networks and studios? Because it's, it's so cool to see like yeah. Tyler Perry and Ava DuVernay and... Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i and it's funny because as i was researching i i hadn't realized there were so many and a lot that started off super small and then like they're huge like tally perry studios is huge now you know but it wasn't always that way um and i just i love highlighting those movies because you probably saw monkey pop productions but didn't quite know it was jordan peele or 40 acres and a mule but you didn't know that was spike lee's you know, studio. So there are a lot of films that you can discover there. And I'm glad that they're all in one place. Um, and all, same goes for our networks. A lot of people have not heard of Quelly TV. They haven't heard of Afro. So to go in there and see all those indie films and Nollywood Nigerian films um, and things like that, it's it's pretty amazing. I, I discovered a lot creating the collection. So I'm I'm excited about that. Yeah, well, as Kayla said, check out the Black History Month collection and so much more by saying Black History Month into your remote. And now let's explore even more of what this curation has to offer in a segment called Editor's Picks. Great job, Kim. One of my personal favorite sections of this year's Black History Month collection organizes Black film into mini collections broken out by decades or themes. And we thought we'd take a deeper dive into this experience by looking at our own favorite eras of Black cinema, starting with Kayla. Kayla, can you tell us a little bit about what you chose? I sure can. Um, And it's also my editor pick of the week inside the collection. And it is If Beale Street Could Talk. Um, I actually didn't, I didn't get into indie films a lot until the 2010s, around that time when I really started getting into film. And I must say that if Bill Street could talk, it it was one of my favorite indie films. Um, It came out in 2018. It's a beautiful film adaptation of James Baldwin's novel um, by the same name. And when I read that, the story just captured my heart. I love James Baldwin. Um, fun fact is that I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of him and many other Black uh, literary authors like Toni Morrison and Zora Neale Hurston, Richard Wright, the list goes on. So if there's ever a film based on any of those novels, you can bet your bottom dollar I have seen it. Um, if Bill Street Could Talk takes place in early 1970s Harlem, um, where a daughter and wife-to-be, Tish, our main character, um, recalls the passion and respect and trust that have brought her and her artist fiance, Fani, together. Um, but their plans for their future together is derailed when Fani is arrested for a crime he didn't commit. And so with her family support, she seeks to clear Fani's name and prove his innocence before the birth of their child. Um, so the whole film takes place of her just trying to, to get him um, uh, free so he can be there for his family. Um, the film received numerous accolades um, including Best Supporting Actress wins for Regina King um, at the Oscars and the Golden Globes. Um, it was also nominated for Best Motion Picture Drama, Best Screenplay, um, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Original Score. So it's great. It's a beautiful film. And uh, I think I'll watch it again sometime this month. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, uh, my pick. So... <clears throat> I've long been fascinated by the black exploitation era of the 1970s in terms of, of films, um, because it was an era in which 
Black filmmakers and Black actors who were underrepresented in Hollywood basically took matters into their own hands and made movies that served and entertained Black audiences, often on a shoestring budget, and actually got them into theaters where audiences could see them. And at the time, the roles available to Black actors were often maids, servants, criminals, or some sort of unsavory character. Um, but in these black exploitation films, the black characters were not only heroes, they were absolute badasses. Um, even when the leads were not traditional heroes, like in Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, Hitman, or The Mac, or when they were blood-sucking vampires, like in Blackula. The point is, uh, the black exploitation era represented black filmmakers and actors controlling their own narratives in films writing their own stories, creating their own heroes, and serving their own audiences in a way that had never been seen before. Um, and one of the biggest stars of the black exploitation era was Pam Greer, uh, who appeared in films like Coffee, Sheba Baby, Friday Foster, Hitman, Scream, Blackula Scream, and of course, one of the most iconic black exploitation films of all time, Foxy Brown. Um, and in this movie, Pam Greer plays a woman seeking revenge on a gang of drug dealers that murdered her boyfriend. Um, if you've never seen it, it's well worth the watch. This is an iconic character. No cinephile or someone who says, I love movies, can claim that they love movies until they've seen <laughs> Foxy Brown. Um, and uh, you can find that in Kayla's uh, Black Exploitation section in this movie timeline. And I had so much fun, like, digging through there and seeing what you had included and just these like, I'm also like a huge movie art nerd and like the posters of this era were some of the best movie posters ever created for like Shaft. They were good. Oh, they were so yeah. good. Um, <laughs> so were. I just sat there and I, I just like looked through all these movie posters as well. Um, but it's so cool. And Pam Greer is also like just an, an I icon of cinema especially as as like a, a black leading lady like so much to love here so much to love in this section so that's my pick um gordon I love it what what era in film did you go with well uh i chose the 80s and the 90s uh be just to date myself uh because that's when i grew up and uh you know when i <laughs> when i got the list i was like if this movie is on the list it is my pick hands down, and it was. And that movie is the 1991 uh, Boys in the Hood, uh, which, uh, you know, personally, you know, this was kind of marked when I went from being like a, a kid to like a teenager and, and as, as a, uh, you know, a theater kid and someone who's really into movies, it kind of is kind of like the cutoff point to when, you know, you you start focusing on on more dramatic fare. And uh, Boys in the Hood is the, the story of a young man who gets in an, into an altercation at school uh, and his mom, goes to send him to live with his auntie and uncle in Bel Air. Actually, no, it's the opposite of that. She sends him to live with his father in South Central LA. Um, it's just, the cast is insane. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., Lawrence Fishburne, Angela Bassett, Morris Chestnut, um, and a to, to bring it back, uh, Regina King has a small role in uh, Boys in the Hood. Uh, and then also mm -hmm. Ice Cube. Um, and I, I believe this is Ice Cube's first acting role, which opens up something that I could talk about for hours, is the fact that rappers like Ice Cube and Queen Latifah and Eminem and Ice-T all seem to make great actors, but singers like Britney, St Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, uh, seem to make, uh, Mariah Carey, seem to be bad actors. I, I, don't, I, wonder, I don't know why that is, but uh, Ice Cube does a fantastic job in this movie. And, and the one thing I wanted to call out, which really struck me, uh, when I was younger was, uh, there was a movie called Stand By Me. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was based on a, a Stephen King book where four young men uh, in the, I believe it's the 50s or 60s, um, go on a, it starts off with one of them saying, do you want to see a dead body? And the entire movie is them walking miles and miles, days and days to go find this, this dead body that, that they knew was out there. And Boys in the Hood kind of starts off similarly with four young men, do you want to see a dead body? And they just have to walk like a street over to see one. It was really opened my eyes back then um, to the, the differences in, in time periods and locations. Um, it's fantastic. It's one of those movies that you watch it differently as a kid, as when you want, maybe don't watch it as a kid, as a teenager, <laughs> than as a parent. Uh, Furious Styles, Lawrence Fishburne's character is amazing. Um, 
just, but when I watched as a young man, I would relate to Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character, Trey, and be like, you know, he's a good dad, but he is kind of rough. And now you watch it as a parent, you know, mm -hmm. trying, you know, all you think about is trying to steer your kid the right way and keep them safe. Uh, so it's just a fantastic role uh, from Lawrence Fishburne. This whole cast is just amazing. Uh, directed by John Singleton. Uh, he was nominated for Academy Award for his directing. I believe he was the youngest director at the time to be nominated uh, and also the first African-American director to be nominated. And this was his first director's credit on IMDb. It's just like, it's literally knocked it out of the park, his first attempt. Uh, so just can't say enough good things about this movie. Uh, it really meant a lot to me today and to watch it again uh, through new eyes as a parent, just, you know, just knocked me for a loop. Just a fantastic movie. It's so good. You didn't. Yeah. yeah, you didn't set me up by talking about the most heartbreaking scene of the movie. I don't want to talk about it, David. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to... Uh, no, spo spoiler alert, there's a very emotional scene where a beloved character meets his end, and I'm still not okay with it. So, David... I don't think any of us are. No, the first time... <laughs> I, I actually did see it as a kid for the first time because um, I had a... I had a baby, we had a couple of babysitters, my sister and I, um, who would like watch things that were not appropriate for us on TV. Cool babysitters. And, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and one of those was Boys in the Hood. And when that death happened, she, I distinctly remember her sitting there on the couch crying and being like, he was going to go to college, <laughs> like <laughs> sobbing and like. This is the same babys babysitter who also cried over the death of Rebecca Gayhart's character in 90210. Uh, she cried a lot at TV. <laughs> it's, well, whoa, 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 whoa. Is there something had your wrong time. about had crying your during Boys in the Hood? That is a hill I'm prepared to die on. <laughs> no. Because you, you know it's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. And... I know. You they're see it coming. You, I know. You can't, you can't save them. But when you grow up with a babysitter who's constantly crying, I mean, it's bound to do some damage. Mm -hmm. to the children. So, I don't know. Heart, heart of stone. Heart of stone on David. <laughs> no! I sob Again. at everything. David laughed. He, like, when it happened, he's like... <laughs> no. Certainly not. Don't put that out there. Oh, no. I would 100% cry now. And I think I would dread watching this as an adult because I would know that movie or that moment is coming. Yeah. Like, yeah. It'd be tough. Um, so you can check out all of the movies we just discussed and much more, of course, by saying Black History Month into your voice remote. Next up, we explore the best comedies of the past and present in a segment called Best Up. Peacock's reimagining of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, entitled simply Bel-Air, premieres next weekend on Sunday, February 13th. And since it's Black History Month, it got us thinking about the best Black-led sitcoms and TV comedies of the past and present, all of which can be found within Xfinity's Black experience. With the classic Fresh Prince and brand new Bel Air in mind, Kayla, which past and present TV comedies did you want to showcase today? I've got, this was hard. This was really hard because <laughs> There's so many yep. that I love, um, but I have to go with Sister Sister um, for my classic because I I always just saw myself in them. I, I just loved the show. I've always been a huge fan of Tia and Tamara, um, and I thought of myself as a triplet, and um, they're, <laughs> or they're my big sister. Sister, sister, sister. Uh, Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I love them in this show. I've seen, of course, I've seen every episode. I know all the, the taglines like, go home, Roger, and all that stuff. It's just great. I know the theme song. I wish I could just download the theme song and just play that on my Spotify. And how does it go? It's on Spotify. How does that theme song go? Now, which one? Uh, which one? There's two. Uh, if There's you mention two. a theme song, I'm going to prompt you to sing it. <laughs> That, I don't have a lot there, of them, like, but that's one of them. Was there two? I, th I only there know the one. There were two. They kind of remixed it. Like um, in the later seasons, they oh. remixed it. Yeah. And it when they like got older. Like that. Yeah, when they got older and they were more grown. And it was like, sister, <laughs> sister. You know, um, it was just so good. We got there. Such a good show. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> um, and of course, my current pick has to be Family Reunion because I just follow them wherever they go. Um, and Tia Mari is in family reunion 
Um, and so, of course, when I found out she was in a new sitcom, I was like, you know, I'm going to watch it. Uh, yeah. And so Loretta Devine is in this one. It's so cute. It's on Netflix um, about this family who goes to live in southern Georgia um, with their parents, the grandparents who are kind of straight laced and all that good stuff. So it's a good one. And she's a parent. So, like, I feel like I just watch them grow up, even though I'm younger than them. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're my sister, too. So. Kayla, didn't you recently interview Tia or Tamara for a Hangout episode? I did. I got to talk to Tamara, and it was, like, the best ever. And she said I was sweet. And I was like, you are, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. Yeah. Just say hang out with Kayla to go watch that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, for my picks, I was really, really excited about this because I love a throwback. Um, for my classic series, you know I had to go with the cornerstone of ABC's TGIF lineup, Family Matters. Fun fact, Family Matters was actually a spinoff of the sitcom Perfect Strangers, in which actress Jo Marie Payton's character Harriet Winslow was the elevator operator at Larry and Balky's office. Harriet's husband, Chicago police officer Carl Winslow, even made an appearance. The character was such a hit that she was given her own show and an entire family, and Family Matters, was born. Of course, it wasn't a member of the Winslow family proper that ended up making the show famous. It was a nerdy, cheese-loving, accident-prone next-door neighbor <laughs> named Stephen Q. Urkel that made the series a pop culture phenomenon. Family cheese Matters loving. ran for... He, he was. He loved cheese. I... I, I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Family Matters ran for nine seasons and 215 episodes. And while I love it for all the lighthearted, goofy moments, for some reason, it was the very special episodes that really stick with me. Like when Laura's friend got shot by a girl gang stealing sneakers or when Urkel got drunk and fell off of a roof, which is a thing that happened. Uh, or when the Dragons gang trashed Rachel's cafe and beat up Eddie, which was devastating when he walks in, his face is all like bloodied and bruised. Um, the entire season or series is worth revisiting, and it's available now on HBO Max. As for my current comedy pick... Before you yes, move on, are you trying go to say it. that the episode where Stefan Urkel showed up wasn't one of the more serious episodes of Family Matters? <laughs> Was that, was no, that like, I would a cousin, argue, like, like a suave I, Urkel? I would argue that by the time Stefan showed up, the show had jumped the shark a little bit. Or when uh, Myrtle Urkel showed up, which was just jolly old white in drag, basically. Although I loved uh, Aunt Una from Altoona, which was Donna Summer played Urkel's <laughs> Aunt Una from Altoona. Was there an Urkel robot at some point? Am I remembering this correctly? No, he, he made a robot, robot too. Right? <laughs> okay. Yes. It looked just like Urkel. It looked like the robots from Bill and Ted's um, Bogus Journey. It, it was like that same vibe where it was just Urkel, but like you mean metallic. Stations Creations? Yes. <laughs> that was a deep cut. That is a deep cut. It really was. I didn't think, I didn't think we'd reference Station from Bill and Ted today, but here we are. Here we are. Um, for my <laughs> current comedy pick, I went with the BET series 20s. Uh, created by Lena Waithe, the series is a semi-autobiographical story about a queer Black girl named Hattie and her two straight best friends as they navigate love, life, and their careers in Los Angeles. I absolutely loved this show when it premiered in March 2020, and then we had to wait a whole 19 months before getting a season two. I 100% thought it was not coming back, but it did, and the show still boasts an 88% uh, uh, fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, for me, the standout of the series is newcomer Jonica Gibbs, um, who plays Hattie, a suddenly homeless, struggling screenwriter who wants to make it in LA, but absolutely doesn't want to do the work to make it happen. Um, she's not necessarily lazy, she just like wants to go straight to writing movies and TV and like doesn't want to get coffee or do any of the, the leg work, the grunt work to get there. And like, honestly, who can blame her? To, to These Gen you know. Zers, I tell you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's very funny. It has surprising moments of heart and builds characters that you really end up rooting for and relating to. And if you've enjoyed any of Lena Waite's work in Master of None or The Shy, 
You should definitely give 20 as a try now on BET. Both mm-hmm. seasons are available to binge. Uh, Gordon, hit us with your throwback and your new series. I think I can tie mine uh, to both of your throwbacks uh, because it's a spinoff and it had a rock and theme song uh, talking about uh, a different world. Uh, which aired from 1987 to 1993, was a spinoff of The Cosby Show. Uh, Originally, it followed uh, Denise Cosby uh, as she attended the fictional Hillman uh, College. Uh, It's kind of an interesting story about this show. It started off uh, season one uh, with Lisa Bonet and Marissa Torme uh, playing roommates at the the college. And then it had like a complete retooling uh, in season two where it started to focus on Jasmine Guy, who was my girlfriend, uh, her character Whitley and uh, Kadeem Hardison, his character Dwayne Wayne. And I am not exaggerating when I say every kid in my school wanted Dwayne Wade. Uh, Dwayne Wade. I keep saying Dwayne Wade, like the basketball player. Uh, the glasses that flipped up. And we all wanted. Yes. Um, boy, I, 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 I just remember like loving that show, loving those glasses. And it was a comedy, but it would tackle big issues. Uh, it had so many big names, like uh, uh, Jada Pink- Pinkett Smith was a part of it in later years. Uh, Sinbad was part of the cast as regulars. But then you had uh, cameos by like uh, Patti LaBelle, uh, Tisha Campbell, Holly Berry, uh, En Vogue. You're never going to get it. Um, Whoopi Goldberg, Tupac Shakur. <laughs> uh, and th- uh, this, I'm going to date myself. Uh, Chris Another Cross. rapper. See? The rapper. Oh, rappers yeah. rappers yeah. it. Singers. Singers can't act, but rappers can act. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Criss Cross, so the Daddy Mac and the Mac Dad were uh, part of it. Uh, another fun fact uh, was I learned it was the highest rated television pilot of all time to this day. And the way ratings work, that's never going to be broken, uh, you know, with all segmentation. So of all time, like from now to the end of time, uh, it's Dwayne Wayne and his glasses are the highest rated uh, <laughs> TV pilot of all time, and rightfully so. Uh, and my uh, what is current, it? Wait, uh, show. wait, you're not going to be able to move on without singing the the <laughs> different world theme song after making Kayla uh, sing a theme song. It was. Uh, I know my parents love me. Stand behind me, come what may. I know some something something because I finally heard them say it's a different world. From where you coming from? Mm. That nice. was kind of where you come from. I put <laughs> like I was made it like, like it's been a while uh, it was the whitest this... version of the different world theme I know, song right? you could have possibly word. done um, are, we're, uh, this isn't live right we can go back and edit that out Yeah. oh it is live Hey, hey, Twitter. Um, <laughs> anywho, uh, my next show uh, my, my current show first of all, shout out to Abbott Elementary which is excellent, um, but I picked Blackish. Uh, Blackish, um, I'm, I'm sure it needs no introduction, but it's a show about the Johnsons, an upper class family uh, living in America today. Uh, Anthony Anderson is the lead, and it blows my mind because the first time I introduced him was in the TV show The Shield. He used to air on FX, and he played a hardened criminal that you do not want to mess with. And now he plays lovable dad, getting in all kind of hijinks. Uh, Tracy Ellis Ross is in this. She's fantastic. Throwback to my movie pick, Lawrence Fishburne is in it as well. Uh, all the kids in it are hilarious. Uh, I want to shout out Jennifer Lewis, who plays uh, Anthony Anderson's uh, mother, Ruby. She is, every time she's on on screen, I love it, and I'm and I'm laughing. Uh, and the reason <laughs> I picked this, like, first of all, it's a fantastic comedy, um, and it deals with a lot of really interesting and important issues. But the reason I picked it was um, the season four premiere was called Juneteenth, and it talked about uh, the holiday. Uh, where uh, the day that, that slavery was ended officially in the United States, uh, troops arrived in Galveston, Texas, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was signed. And it's a you know a, 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 a holiday that I learned about, not from my high school, not for you know four years of college. I learned about it from a, a sitcom in my in my early forties, which is sad, but like awesome for them to 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 be able to get that out to people. But Really, really kind of sad that it like it took this for me to 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 learn about you know this important day. So uh, the, again, a funny show with uh, often you know like they they go serious too and have have really good messages. So uh, check out Blackish and Albert, Abbott Elementary as well. And there's no theme song, so I don't have to sing anything. I don't think there's a theme song. <laughs> right. It's just like a ding. Yeah, it's just like a ding. Yeah, <laughs> the, the ding is the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> like the Netflix wah. Just, 
<laughs> right. <laughs> well, you can right. check out all the shows we just talked about and so much more. Just say Black Experience into your voice remote. And before we head out for the week, we are here to help you organize your TV watch list in a segment called Plan Ahead. This week's premieres include the TV adaptation of a Tom Cruise movie, yet another power spinoff series, an all-new psychological thriller, and a bunch of baby geniuses. Kayla, give us the rundown. Step into the world of Jack Reacher, a veteran military police investigator who has been falsely accused of murder. Before he knows it, he's thrust into a cyclone of dirty cops, conniving businessmen, and shady politicians. Based on the novels by Lee Child, this new binge-worthy crime thriller is sure to wow its audience. Reacher premieres February 4th on Prime Video. This next one is Southern Charm at its finest. Sweet Magnolias is back for a second season, and it's been a long time coming. Watch as three lifelong friends navigate small town drama, romance, and their families in Serenity, Georgia. And if you're up for a fuzzy, cozy, low stakes drama, look no further. Sweet Magnolias premieres February 4th on Netflix. The Power Universe is expanding once again with its thrilling fourth installment. Power Book 4, Force, follows the original series' main character, Tommy Egan. For those of us who watched the original Power, we know things didn't quite turn out so well for him back in New York. So he's decided to leave town and take on the windy city of Chicago. Tommy's quest to become the biggest drug dealer in the city will prove to be quite deadly. But honestly, I think he's built for it. Power Book 4, Force, premieres February 6th on Stars. Jeopardy is such a timeless game show, and I couldn't be more excited for the 2022 National College Championship. Undergrads from 36 colleges and universities across the country will compete head to head in the most demanding intellectual challenge yet. There's a lot on the line, including money, pride, and of course, bragging rights. Join in and cheer on your alma mater in this special two week tournament. Jeopardy! National College Championship premieres February 8th on ABC. Cue the chills and eerie vibes. The Girl Before follows the story of a PR exec named Jane who gets the chance to move into a beautiful minimalist home designed by David, the home's supremely mystifying architect. But in order to live there, Jane must adhere to David's strange house rules. After moving in, she soon discovers that the home's previous tenant, Emma, suspiciously died there, causing Jane to question her fate. The Girl Before premieres on HBO Max. And this week's finales include a bittersweet series finale, one last visit to Flavortown, a farewell to a cursed island, and the last chapter in the book of cinema's most famous bounty hunter. Gordon, tell us more. Thanks, David. Well, all good things must come to an end, and so too must our favorite series, uh, but uh, hopefully they go out with a bang. Uh, this is what we've got for you for finales for this week. Uh, we're going to kick things off with the series finale of Claws, coming to TNT on Sunday, February 6th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Everything is set up for the big final showdown with Quiet Anne, and I'll be honest, with all the twists and turns this season, I have no idea which way this is going, but uh, I can't wait. Uh, then, over on the Food Network at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Guy Fieri's Chance of a Lifetime is going to pick its big winner. Hopefully someone is there to console poor Landon as this season comes to an end. I know he gets very emotional when it comes to Guy Fieri. Uh, anywho, uh, the final six are going to compete at the Fry or Fly Fest in Nashville, which apparently is a real thing. Uh, the winner is taking home the keys to Guy's new Chicken Guy franchise. Uh, also, that same night, we've got the finale for Blade Runner Black Lotus on Adult Swim at midnight. And just like the Big Claws finale, we're finally going to see what happens when Elle faces off against the architect of her suffering. Ooh, that's, that's dark. Architect of her suffering. Yikes. Um, on Tuesday, uh, February 8th, uh, be sure to check out the finale of Beyond Oak Island on the History Channel. That's at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. In this big finale, the team will head down to Texas in search of a silver mine worth over $1 billion, with a B, dollars. Holy cow. Are you kidding me? Is this like those Bigfoot shows where they search for a Bigfoot and never find him or her? Uh, because if I found a billion dollars, I would not stick around to finish my show. I would be off on a beach somewhere. 
Uh, and finally, we close the first chapter in the Book of Boba Fett over at Disney Plus on February 9th. Now, I'm more of a Marvel guy than a Star Wars guy, but I gotta say, Disney has been knocking it out of the theme park with these series. Just amazing. I don't wanna get all spoilery, so I'm just gonna say I can't wait to see what happens. That's what I got for you, David. Back to you, buddy. And if you're looking for a tease of what's coming a little further out, Dollface re returns for season two on Hulu February 11th. Netflix's highly anticipated Anna Delvey miniseries Inventing Anna drops on February 11th as well. Peacock unveils the all-new Bel Air reimagining on February 13th. The Walking Dead winter finale, or I'm sorry, The Walking Dead winter premiere drops a full week early on AMC Plus on February 13th. And of course, the Los Angeles Rams take on the Cincinnati Bengals in Super Bowl 56 on Super Bowl Sunday, February 13th. Gordon, are you a Rams fan? Because I know you love St. Louis. Do you follow them from St. Louis to L.A.? The, so here's the thing. I love football, and I grew up in St. Louis, but I moved away to Philadelphia between when the Cardinals left and the Rams showed up. So I don't really have a rooting interest. I kind of rooted for the Rams back when they lived when they, when they played in St. Louis. But the good thing is I can watch football without getting stressed out about it uh, because I don't care who wins. It's just I, I root for a good game, and I've been I've been very lucky the last couple of weekends. Uh, so yeah, like no no rooting interest, just enjoy the sport. Like it's like when I watch a Cardinals baseball game, I get stressed out and it ruins my day. So I, it's mm. kind of fun to not have a rooting interest. Must be nice as an Eagles fan. I don't know what it's like to not be constantly miserable. Uh, and what <laughs> one a great year. way! To, one year. What a great way! Four years ago today, the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Greatest day of my life. That's a great way to end the show. Nick Foles. Hail to, to Nick Foles. And that will do it for today's show. Huge thanks to my fellow Xfinity editors, Kayla and Gordon, for joining me. If you want to check out the TV shows and movies we talked about today, get more of our entertainment recommendations, or watch us interview big celebrities, just say what to watch into your voice remote, or tune in here every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern for a new episode. My name is David. Thank you for joining us on What to Watch Live.